Okay, so thanks, David, for the for the nice introduction, and also thank you for the invitation. So, what I would like to talk about uh, is robustness in uh, biological systems and neural neural systems, and how we can understand it geometrically. And the first thing I actually want to point out that there's a bit of a puzzle, because on the one hand, there are experiments that sort of suggest that neural systems are quite robust, but on the other hand. There are also experiments that suggest that they can be very sensitive. So I want to show some of these experiments first. So here's an experiment that really suggests that neural systems can be very sensitive. And it's from an experiment in the lab of Michael Brecht. And what they did is that they basically patched a pyramidal cell in the primary motor cortex of a mouse, a rat, I think in this case, actually it was not a mouse, a rat. Um, and then they injected a current into that cell, just 10 action potentials, and that is shown here. So 10 action potentials injected into a single cell in the primary motor cortex of a, a, a rat. And then what they observed is that after the injection of that current, one of the whiskers of the rat starts moving. And that is sort of an amazing experiment because it illustrates that there's sensitivity you know, action potentials generated in a single cell um, that you can actually observe behaviorally. And since then, there have been a bunch of other experiments and maybe some argument on how many cells exactly you need, but it's clear that cortical systems are highly sensitive to injection of action potentials, either in motor systems, but also in sensory systems, where it has been shown that animals can detect just few action potentials, basically, and then you know, have a behavior report based on those action potentials. On the other hand, we also know that neural systems can be very robust. So this is from an experiment of the lab of Karl Svoboda, where they basically have a, a mouse in this case that is detecting a little pole. So the pole is shown here in blue or in red, and it can have a posterior and anterior position. And what the animal has to do is depending on what the position is, lick either left or right. So that's the task. So basically the task is, you know, there's a pole that is advanced to a particular position. The animal can sample it with the whiskers and there's a delay of 1.3 seconds. And then the response of the animal basically left or right. And here's a neuron, one of the neurons um, in the anterior lateral motor cortex, so ALM. And what you can see is basically a raster plot of that particular neuron over many trials that shows either the condition leak right or the condition leak left. And you basically see this neuron is not responding during the sample and then it has some persistent activity, ramping activity during the delay with the firing of the neuron uh, ramps up mostly in case of the right leaks. Now what they did in this experiment is that they inhibited this neuron using optogenetic techniques in this case. They simply inhibit that neuron in the middle of this delay period for, I think it was 200 milliseconds. And what they observed is that after this inhibition, um, the activity of this neuron comes right back. And I should be more specific because it's not that they just inhibited that neuron, they inhibited the whole area. So they inhibit one side of the, the left, the ipsilateral side of the anterior lateral motor cortex. So the whole area is being inhibited. And despite the fact that all of the neurons are being silenced, the activity comes right back and the animal performs the task just as before. So it's an example where now lots of neurons are being silenced, but it has no behavioral effect on what the animal is doing. And uh, similarly, for me, a very amazing experiment comes from the lab of David Dupre in Oxford, where they did the following experiment. So here they inhibit not just an area, but they inhibit all the neurons that are active in that area and the area being the hippocampus. So here are the mouse that is running around in a circular arena and through you know, a crazy uh, set of optogenetic techniques, they're able to tag only the neurons that will be active when the mouse is running around in that arena. Okay, So they're tagging all the place cells that are active when the animal is running around in that arena. They tag these place cells and then they uh, express an opsin in the place cells that allows them to shut them down. And that is shown here. So on this off scenario, the normal scenario, you basically see one of the cells 
that is basically responsive to the position on the on the lower left. Then you have a cell that's responsive to the position on the left, or cell responsive to the position on the right. And these are three place cells. Now they go in, and for ten seconds they shut down all of these place cells. They silence all of the place cells, and that is shown here, called on because they turn the light on. And when they turn the light on, all the activity in the place cells disappears. So now you would expect, since all the place cells are silenced, that maybe the animal would be disoriented or something would happen. But instead, nothing happens. Rather what happens and what they find is that there have been other cells that were previously silent. So they weren't really place cells. They didn't respond to any particular location. And as soon as the light is turned on, and the whole place cell codes disappeared, these cells suddenly become place cells. So the place cell code basically instantaneously recovers. So it's again an example where there's a very strong perturbation, but the system seems to be robust to it. So to summarize this type of data, I've shown you sensitivity versus robustness, but it's not sensitivity versus robustness in exactly similar cases, because the sensitivity we've seen has been sensitivity to excitatory perturbations, whereas the robustness I've shown you has been robustness to inhibitory perturbation, so to silencing of neurons. Now, we also know that the system is sensitive to strong excitatory perturbations, even though I didn't show you the experiments. We don't really know whether the system is robust or sensitive to weak inhibitory perturbations, because at least I don't know, because I haven't found anyone doing that type of experiment. My suspicion would be, given that the systems are often robust to strong inhibitory perturbations, that they could also be robust to weak inhibitory perturbations. So why is that? So one possibility, and you know, as people working in biology, that is always a possibility we have to take into account, is that while well, I've shown you different systems, right? These are experiments that are done under different conditions in different parts of cortex, and this could just be biological diversity, right? Each experiment requires its own explanation and that's it. Alternatively, and this is you know, where as a theorist, um, that's often what we strive for, it could just be that there's one underlying principle of circuit dynamics that allows the system to be very sensitive to excitatory perturbations and yet very robust to inhibitory perturbations. So I'm going to argue that that is the case. And I would want to give you simple geometric illustrations of how that could work. So to do so, I'm going to start with a network of integrated fire neurons. Um, so here we have a network of leaky integrated fire neurons. So there's some someone talking. Um, if there's a question, just uh, ask me the question. Okay, otherwise there's a network of leaky integrated fire neurons. So V is the voltage of the neurons. The neurons have a leak, minus V. They, have an, uh, they get uh, some injection of input signals, XJ, um, with basically feed forward weights, Fij, and then there are recurrent connections that feed the spike trains of the network back into the networks. And these recurrent connections I'm calling omega ik here. So assume basically this is a network of integrated current-based integrated fire neurons. The spike trains are just modeled as delta functions. Um, I'm assuming analog inputs, uh, continuous inputs, could also be spike train inputs, but for simplicity, I'm assuming continuous inputs. And then there's some kind of recurrent connectivity. So what I want to do is, oh, and the, and the, neur and the network neurons have thresholds and a reset that is integrated into the recurrent connect connection matrix. So what I want to do is, I want to take a simple approach here and make the system, this integrated fire network into an autocoder, autoencoder or ATA converter. So a system that converts analog signals into spike tanks back into analog signals. Okay. The reason I'm going to do that is because that is sort of the simplest system in which I can illustrate the effects of robustness versus sensitivity that I want to illustrate you. 
And at the end of the talk, we can sort of discuss to what extent that generalizes to more complex systems. So let's look at this system, the autoencoder or analog digital analog converter. So we have these inputs here, xj of t, and we have the outputs, the spike chains, sk of t. So the first thing we want to do is we want to turn these spike trains back into something that we can compare with the inputs. And we're going to do this by uh, designing a linear readout. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to filter the spike trains through into, um, so we're going to replace every spike by an exponential kernel that is shown here. Or alternatively, we can say we convolve the spike train with an exponential kernel. Similar the way a synapse does, uh, a post synapse that will receive the spike train. And we call that the instantaneous firing rate. And then we're going to map all these instantaneous firing rates with a matrix DJK, a decoder matrix, onto a linear readout. And that linear readout, I'm just going to call x hat of j. And here's the equation of the linear readout. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to filter the spike train and then have a linear mapping onto uh, a set of signals that are comparable to the input signal, which we call xj hat of t, which is the readout. And the task of the system is to make sure that this readout is as similar as possible to the inputs with a constraint that there have to be spikes in the middle. Now, there are several possibilities of how we can do that. So one is we can just derive an, uh, the optimal connectivity from a loss function which is what we have done in previous work. We can also learn the optimal connectivity, which we have published in PLOS CB two years ago. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to show you a geometric view of what the optimal connectivity is and how we can understand it geometrically, just for this simple system, okay? I recognize another system that does a lot because you know, it just receives an input, transfers into the spike trains, and then you know, regenerates the input. But it will be a system that allows us to understand this trade-off between robustness and sensitivity. So how are we going to do that? So just give me like one second here to move something in my Zoom window, because otherwise I don't have a control of time, okay. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to just look at a single neuron and we're going to ask this neuron, should it spike or should it not spike? So here's the thing neuron. I have a, an example where there are basically two inputs into the neuron, x1 and x2. And those two inputs are shown here in, in gray lines on the right-hand side against time. These two inputs feed into the neuron. The neuron spikes. And those spikes are then being read out by two readout units, x1 hat and x2 hat. And, that is, and the readout is shown here in these black lines. So what I want to ask is, at this time point shown by the vertical dotted line, should the neuron spike or should it not spike? Now, if the neuron spikes, it will change the readout. So there will be a contribution to the readout. And this change of the readout, we can visualize in signal space. See on the left-hand side, I show you a signal space. It's basically x1 axis and x2 axis. The signal x is shown in gray. So that's the input to the neuron at that particular time point. And the readout x hat is shown in black and it's the output of these readout units. So the actual readout of the system at that particular time point. Now, if the neuron spikes, it's going to change the readout. It's going to change the readout in a direction given by its contribution to the readout. That contribution is given by the numbers D1i and D2i. So it's a vector, it's a decoding vector. And we can just illustrate that by a shift of the readout in the direction of the vector di. Now, looking at that, we sort of see that, for instance, if the readout is down here in the lower left, then it would indeed make sense for the neuron to spike. On the other hand, if the readout is up here in the upper left, then it would not make sense for the neuron to spike because it would move the readout further away from the signal. And so by these sort of geometric arguments, we see that we can divide the space into one half space that says where the neuron shouldn't spike and another half space where the neuron should spike. 
And this is optimal in the sense that the neuron will now only spike to improve the readout. If there's no reason, if there's no way for the neuron to improve the readout, then it will not spike. Now, when the neuron spikes generally will be when it leaves the no spike zone and hits this green line, which is the threshold of the neuron. Now, threshold may remind me already of, you know, the way we think about neurons in terms of having a threshold. When it reaches that threshold, it will spike and then reach another line, which we could call the reset of that neuron, because it's a line that's parallel to the threshold line, just by geometric arguments. And you can therefore see that there is a whole set of parallel lines that in some sense correspond to the voltage of the neuron. In the sense that now the neuron has a threshold and a reset and its voltage is just given by these voltage isoclines that are shown as all these parallel lines. Mathematically, what we have done is we've just taken the projection of the input signal X, subtracted the readout X hat and taken the inner product with this decoder vector di, okay? And that inner product of the error and the decoding vector, that is the voltage di. So we project the error between the readout and the signal onto the decoding vector di, and we call that the voltage. Biophysically, here's how we can see what happens. So instead of just having the inputs into the neuron, that uh, let the neuron spike and then it has the readouts, we now feed the readouts back and subtract them from the inputs, okay? That's the only thing we did here. Now we can simulate this single neuron and that is shown here. So we have these inputs in gray, there are two inputs. One is now in solid gray, the other one is in dotted gray. Um, the neuron then generates spikes according to these two inputs. And the spikes are filtered to give you a readout. There are two readouts here, the black readout and the dotted readout, okay? The readout on the other hand is subtracted from the inputs. And this subtraction is reflected in the voltage of the neuron. So every time the neuron spikes, the readout jumps up. And because the readout jumps up, it's subtracted from the input, the voltage jumps down. And this jumping down of the voltage in this case is simply the reset of that neuron, okay? So this is just for a single neuron. Now a single neuron cannot represent a two-dimensional signal. And while you see that at the beginning, these two input signals are more or less captured by the readout, when the two input signals change, the readout actually does not necessarily notice that. And the reason for that is, that we're not bounding the error in all directions. We only bounded the error in one specific direction, which was given by the decoding vector of that neuron. So to be able to bound the error in other directions, we'll need to introduce more neurons. So here I'm showing you a yellow neuron um, that also receives the input x1 and x2, but it now weights them differently because there's a different contribution to the readout. And then I can introduce more neurons and in this case, I'm introducing five neurons altogether with which I can close and close the signal X and make sure that the readout stays within this arrow bounding box, okay? Which in this case is a pentagon. And if I do this, I get five voltages. I get the spikes of these neurons. And now I see that the readout indeed tracks the inputs. I'm gonna show a movie that illustrates this a bit better in a second. Um, the first thing I want to point out is that this network can also be reinterpreted because really it's the projection of the error x minus x hat onto this decoding vector of the neuron di, but we can expand that. And then we see when we expand it, so when we take the definition of the readout x hat, which was the decoding vector times the filtered firing rates r, if we expand that, we get a term which is the inner product of decoding vectors of neuron i and neuron j, which corresponds to a synaptic weight. And if we take the derivative of this equation, then we get a network of leaky integrated fire neurons, which is what we started out with, but one that now has a very specific connectivity. So it has feed forward inputs that are given by the decoding vectors of the individual neurons, and it has recurrent inputs 
that are given by the inner products of the decoding vectors of two neurons. Okay. So that's a network of leaky integrand fire neuron. It has symmetric connectivity. It has very specific feedforward input, but it performs this ADA conversion that I promised. Now at this point, I just like to show movies um, because I think there's sort of strength in visualizing what happens in this network uh, geometrically. And so here's how this is going to work. So we have on the left-hand side, the signal space. So this is signal X1 and signal X2. The signals I'm going to represent are a sine wave and a cosine, a sine and a cosine. And they're shown here with this uh, gray open circle. It is now going to move around in a circle, okay? It's going to move around on a circle for a sine and a cosine. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the network and have the network produce spikes such that from the spikes, we can read out the gray signal. So here you have the gray signal. There's a sine and a cosine. Now I'm turning on 12 neurons. And these 12 neurons are now going to track the signal. So what you're seeing here is the thresholds of the 12 neurons, similar to the bounding box that I just explained. And the black circle is the readout that you from the spike trains of that network. Every time you hit one of these boundaries, the respective neuron is going to spike. And that spike is going to reset the readout into the center of the bounding box. And due to this dynamics of the system, we're now tracking the two input signals through the spikes of this network um, in a way that is uh, optimal according to the criterion that we established. So you see that the neurons are now taking turns and spiking, and thereby they are tracking the signal. So it is indeed just an autoencoder or ADA converter. There's an input X, that is this gray circle that is now moving around here in the signal space. There's the output, which is the black circle, the readout from the spikes. And these are the spikes that the system produces. Now, what I promised you at the beginning of the talk is that I'm gonna explain these uh, ideas of robustness with this system. And indeed, I think this simple geometric illustration of what happens in that integrated fire network already suffices to explain all of these robustness uh, results and sensitivity results that I've shown you earlier. To show that, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to simply inhibit just a single neuron. That single neuron is this blue neuron here. So it's again a movie. Again, we're tracking a sine and a cosine. Um, and what you're going to see is that now we're going to inhibit that blue neuron. When we inhibit it, so we inject an inhibitory current, its threshold is going to recede because it is being inhibited. When the threshold of that neuron recedes, so it, is, it uh, moves out of the box, there's a very, very small change here at that box, but it's really negligible. Basically, the bounding box stays exactly the same even though we just eliminated a neuron. And because the bounding box stays the same, the shape of the bounding box stays the same, our readout stays exactly the same, okay? The same will hold if we start inhibiting multiple neurons. So here again is a simulation, but now I'm going to inhibit multiple neurons. In fact, ha half of all neurons. So 50% of the neurons, I'm simply going to inhibit uh, exactly at the same time. And you're going to see that all of the thresholds are going to recede. So they all move out of the box. However, from these 20 neurons, 10 are now no longer participating in the uh, representation of the readout, but there are 10 left. And those 10 that are left still keep the bounding box, you know, more or less in a, in a roughly circular uh, shape. And therefore, the readout stays exactly the same, okay? So we can just online eliminate half of the network and yet the network represents exactly the same thing that it represented before. Now to the question, can we also eliminate all active neurons? So to eliminate all active neurons in these simple toy examples, we just have to make the following assumptions. We have to make the assumption that there are neurons that participate initially and that there are neurons that initially don't participate in the code. 
I'm going to color code the neurons that don't participate in a slightly darker fashion from the neurons that do participate. So the dark neurons here are the ones that initially do not participate in say the place cell code. So I'm still calling this time, but actually you should maybe call it space and imagine that you're running around in a circular arena. And so what we're going to do is, we're going to now eliminate all the neurons that initially participated in this code, in this place cell code, which is shown now. So we eliminate them all. However, the neurons that previously did not participate, which are these dark neurons, well, they were always there. They were just, just behind the border of the bounding box and they have now become exposed. And so they will now represent the input signal so that you can still read out everything just as you could before. So there will be no deficit in the function of the system. However, you will observe that the neurons that were previously active are now silent and the neurons that are, um, that are new um, are the dark ones. So it's not maybe super clear, but basically in this, in this plot, there's always a light, a dark, a light, a dark, a light neuron. So that initially all the bright neurons were active and afterwards all the dark neurons were active. Now to the question of how this system can be very sensitive to excitatory perturbations. So what we're going to do is we're now going to excite the single neuron. So when we excite a single neuron, the opposite happens to when we inhibit it. So instead of the threshold moving out of the box, where it is sort of hidden, it is going to move into the box and it's therefore going to change the shape of the box. By changing the shape of the box, it is going to create a bias in the readout. The bias in this example is subtle, but it is there. So what we saw is then we excited the blue neuron. The blue neuron became very active. Okay, that's shown here. Um, and it eliminated the ability of all, all the other neurons that actually you know, would otherwise have fired to participate. And by being so active, it causes now a bias between the gray and the black line. So maybe I'll just illustrate it again, because I'm not sure I did a good job explaining this. Um, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to excite the blue neuron here. When we excite the blue neuron, its threshold is going to move into the box and is therefore going to change the shape of the box much more dramatically than we did with the inhibitory perturbations. Because the, the box shape is now changed, that causes a bias in the way the signal is being represented. And that bias is shown here by the difference between the signal and the black line. So the black line is no longer on top of the gray signal. It's now biased away from the gray signal, okay? And so this is a case where the system is now very sensitive. And the reason it's sensitive is because shifting a threshold in changes the shape of the box, whereas shifting a threshold out does not change the shape of the box if there's sufficient redundancy in the system. Um, now, one thing that we can predict basically with a system um, is, has to do with the question of what exactly happens when you lose neurons. And that is now illustrated here. So the first thing I want to illustrate is actually um, related to noise in the system. So noise in the system just means that the thresholds can move around randomly a little bit, which is shown here. And noise in the system can lead to a lot of trial to trial variability. So let me actually start this movie again. So what I wanted to show here is that what happens if you have just a single neuron, in this case, this red neuron, and that is the only neuron you record in the system. And then you do multiple trials of um, the same stimulus. So in this case, the signal I'm going to represent is just, a, is just a constant signal that is going to be turned on at some point. And then I'm going to repeat it trial over trial over trial. So here we have signal and estimate. And here on the lower right, we now have the different trials that show the spike raster of this red neuron over many, many different trials. And what I want to illustrate is that this spike raster becomes, um, is very noisy in some sense. And the reason it's noisy is because whether this particular red neuron, you know, is at the border of the bonding box or not, really depends very sensitively on the noise that, we're going, that we inject in the neuron. 
And so this is a very fast simulation. So I hope it actually goes through Zoom in some sense <laughs> and it's not just lost on the audience. But what you can see now is that over these different trials, the number of spikes that that neuron fires is very random. And basically it's Poisson. So there's a lot of variability in the system if you just subsample from it and just look at a single neuron. On the other hand, if you now start eliminating neurons, so let's say you kill 50% of the neurons, then there are two things that actually happen. So one thing that happens is that this red neuron will fire more spikes than previously because it will be more active because of the other neurons that are no longer active and that are no longer bordering the bounding box. But yet there's something else that also happens and that is the signature of this type of system. And that is that the possibility for variability decreases because the degeneracy of the code gets eliminated by us eliminating more neurons. So if we eliminate even more neurons, um, yet another 50% of neurons, then what we're going to see in this system is that the variability of the red neuron has decreased a lot. So it becomes more regular spiking neuron um, as the firing rate also has increased of that neuron, okay? So that is sort of a prediction that we would make, not just that when you inhibit neurons, there's robustness, but also their increase in firing rates, which may seem trivial, but also that there is a decrease in the CV in the coefficient of variation of the spike trains of the individual neurons. We can then generalize this system. And I'm going to illustrate a few generalizations before I'm gonna uh, finish the talk. So one generalization is what happens if we don't just have two input signals, but if we have more than two input signals. So three input signals, we can still visualize. And what we have to think about when we have three input signals is basically that now this bounding box is more like a soccer ball. And each neuron is now a face of this bounding box, okay? Um, but everything that I illustrated in this 2D system will just as well hold in the 3D system or in any higher dimensional system, even though we won't be able to visualize it anymore. So here in this system, every time one of these thresholds is hit, you see it hits red, it resets the readout. The readout is the black dot here in the middle. And the signal in this case is the black, is the small black dot in the middle that doesn't move. So that is basically the bounding box in three dimensions. Now you could argue, or you should argue that what I'm showing you are some very simple toy models, but I believe in the strength of toy models to illustrate problems. But still, you know, you may ar argue, how can we get this closer to biology? So I'm going to illustrate basically a line of research that we're engaging in at the moment. Some of it was published, some of it is not yet published. And it takes a detour from a standard way of thinking about integrating fire networks um, into a field that you know, we have just discovered for ourselves in the last years is the field of convex optimization. And the reason is that everything I've shown you, all the movies I've shown you can be rephrased as the solution to convex optimization problems in the following way. Um, so what we can think about is that we have a readout, which I previously called X hat, but now I'm gonna call it Y. And that readout Y lives in some kind of M dimensional space. And we can think that what the network actually is doing is solving the following problem. It's solving a problem that's quadratic in Y. So Y transpose Y is just the square of, of, of the Y, the length of Y. Um, then, you know, this linear term, just ignore it. It's, it's, it, should have, it should not be there because I shouldn't talk about the general model, but like a simplified model. So just think this is a quadratic function of Y, basically. And what we are doing is we're minimizing that quadratic function of y. And whenever you minimize the quadratic function, uh, you basically, it's similar to a leak, okay? So the readout leaks to zero in the absence of spiking. And this leaking to zero corresponds to minimization of a quadratic function, okay? It's the same thing mathematically. However, if you minimize that quadratic function subject to a set of constraints, these constraints are given by the bounding box. Each neuron, provides one linear constraint or one linear inequality and the whole set of such linear inequalities defines a convex set and the bounding box is a convex set. So a set of linear inequality constraints 
defines a convex set, okay, which we in this case call the bounding box, but it can be an arbitrary convex set. And so we can understand the dynamics of the bounding box as the minimization of the length of y under a set of uh, inequality constraints. And that is a general quadratic optimization problem uh, or quadratic programming problem. Now we've done that in a space that is this error space where we take x minus y. So we take x minus the readout, the input minus the readout. That's what I've shown you. But of course we can generalize it. It doesn't have to be in this error space. A simple generalization would simply say, well, we don't do this in the error space. We simply do this in the input output space on so the space of X and Y. And that is something we've showed in a, in a Europe's paper uh, two years ago. And it may change the picture, but it doesn't change the general ideas on robustness that I've shown you. So in this case, the network becomes slightly more general. It still has symmetric connectivity. So the recurrent connectivity is still symmetric. In this case, D transpose D. So these are rectangular matrices. But the feedforward connectivity is now no longer locked to be exactly the same thing. It's some other feedforward connectivity. And the input output function of this network in terms of the uh, analog inputs that we feed in and the readouts that we read out is now simply a, uh, a convex function. So the output is a convex func function of the input X that you can basically uh, show by looking at the uh, solution to this quadratic programming problem in general. Um, the dynamics here is still leak dynamics. In this case, the dynamics goes only downwards because there's only a dynamics of uh, Y that is leaking, X is the input, so it's not changing. But the general ideas that I've shown you about robustness, they're still the same. Because imagine that you have all these different neurons here. So these are different neurons. Each neuron basically provides a threshold in this input output space now. And now you can knock out neurons and knocking out a neuron is not going to, or eliminating a neuron in a very redundant system is not going to change the input output function very much. But if you excite the neuron so that it comes out, it is going to change the input output function a lot, okay? So again, the reason there's sensitivity versus robustness is because the neurons are all bordering some kind of you know, uh, convex manifold and it's very redundant. So that if you move out a neuron, the shape of the convex manifold only changes very little. But if you move in a neuron, you're totally changing the shape of the convex manifold and the input output function of the system. This can be further generalized towards networks that have separate inhibitory and excitatory neurons. And there was a nice paper by uh, Lee and Pelevan also in Europe in 2020 that shows how to do that using minimax objectives. And we're now working on bringing these ideas into our geometric framework, but that's you know, almost done, but not quite ready for prime time yet. So to summarize this, the key assumptions that I made was that we assumed that there were signals that can be read out linearly from the spike trains so that we have this ADA converter, but that there are only spikes fired whenever that is necessary to really get the readout to what it's supposed to be. And we assumed that there's a lot of redundancy in the system. Then the key results we had is that the membrane voltage measures something like the projection of a coding error, um, that neurons are integrated in fire neurons, so they're coupled leaky spiking neurons, and that the networks are robust to large inhibitory perturbations, but sensitive to small excitatory perturbations, which we think is consistent with the experimental literature. <clears throat> 